Hello and welcome to another edition of The Rest is Entertainment with me, Marina Hyde. And me, Richard Osman. Hello, Marina. How are you, Richard? Yeah, I'm okay. I'm not too bad. I'm, I'm in the midst of a very big deadline this week. but um, So this is a, a, oh. a lovely little uh, relaxing kind of amuse-bouche. Yeah, before the horror begins. Before the horror begins, um, which is the subtitle of our show this week, because uh, mm. we're talking about baby reindeer and Liz Truss. Yes. Are we not? Uh, and indeed, AI celebrity chatbots, so really the full banquet of, of horrors. Let's start with Baby Rendia. So it's a huge show. It's on Netflix, uh, starring the comedian and written by uh, the comedian Richard Gadd. A true life story about uh, a time when he was stalked and various things that happened after that. It has been an enormous hit for Netflix, what they call a breakout hit. So big it was even, it was even featured on Gogglebox. In fact, when it was on Gogglebox last week, I kept I kept waiting for them just to be on their phones and Googling, because you know, you know that's what that's how everyone watches every TV show now. You can't watch an old Top of the Pops without Googling where the bands are now. You can't watch, uh, you know, any of those American series, the true crime things. You sort of have to wait to the end before you... And you, all you want to do is Google who every single person is, because of course you do. That's what human beings are. That's how we watch television. Um, and drama producers know that as well as anybody. So you have to... Be so careful at all times if you are trying to hide people's identities that it is impossible to find out who they are. It's the story of Richard Gadd's stalker and also of his um, relationship um, and interactions with a TV producer um, who was sort of older and more powerful. And without any more spoilers, I won't say anything more than that. And certainly, yeah, it's become the most talked about show for a long time for a couple of reasons. One, of course, these extraordinary ratings and i suspect that jessica gunning who plays martha will be up for every award going as well uh, but two because it does depict real life events and it is it is sort of bled out into the real world this week apart from the cold open the first words you see on screen are this is a true story now that is actually even within the genre of based on a true story so that's very unusual to see mm. this is a true story rather than based on a true story but last week, what has happened is that because the show has become such a massive hit and it says this is a true story at the beginning, people have got caught up in an absolute frenzy of in internet sleuthing. The woman who Martha is based on has been identified, you know, and obviously she did a, a very bad thing. There have been obviously journalists outside our home. She's had suffered huge numbers of sort of threats on online and the TV producer has been misidentified, mm. I don't know, don't know about correctly identified, but certainly people have been wrongly identified. Richard Gadd himself has had to issue a statement saying, please stop this sleuthing, this is not what our show was about. Mm, well, we'll come to that. And it is an absolute sort of frenzy. And I've talked to a lot of people um, involved in shows like this this week. And it's a big hot topic in the TV industry yes, every, at the moment. Everyone, everyone, everyone is, talking is talking about, about the show. And there are shows to which it owes certain things. That, that sort of first-person point of view, it doesn't break the fourth wall, but that there's there's a lot of flea bag in there to some extent, which was also based on an Edinburgh show. Richard Gadd did two Edinburgh shows, we should say, because that might become relevant later. I May Destroy You, which was Michaela Cole's story of her own sexual assault and the attempt to sort of unravel that and a sort of exploration of the idea of consent and all sorts of things like that. Anyway, um, now both of those were on the BBC and in the case of I May Destroy You uh, was a co-production with HBO. But they took enormous keck. There's something called compliance in television. Yes. And I mean, all the writers and all the producers and all the executives I spoke to this week were like, this thing that's happened with Baby Reindeer, right, should not have happened. This is really bad. I don't know what Netflix have. I, you know, maybe if they had a proper compliance, compliance department, they wouldn't be able to pay their chief executive fifty million dollars a year. But who knows? In fact, Martha is very close, in various ways, to the real life person who stalked Richard Gad. It is easy to identify. It's been very easy for people to identify her. It didn't take any actual sleuthing. You can no. just you can Google certain phrases and it comes up immediately. Certain phrases are used in the show now. You know. Some people may say, oh, well, maybe now she can see what it's like to have people sitting outside her house and getting horrible messages over the internet, which is what happened to him. But, you know, I don't feel that we should, criminal justice should happen in that way. If you talk to people involved in things like the BBC, they say, you know, we've got, well, clearly in this show, in Baby Reindeer, there are vulnerable 
both contributors and people on whom it's based, deeply vulnerable people. And you have someone who is, the BBC have have a part-time commission executive who deals with these types of issues and would have advised. In something like I May Destroy You, they made sure the defining characteristics of the lead characters were really different so that people didn't say, oh, I wonder if it was this, I wonder if it was that. There is a sort of slight sense with Netflix that it's a bit of a wild west and that, you know, now at the moment of his big professional triumph, Richard Gadd is right in the eye of a storm and so are maybe other people up upon whom the, the, the show is based or not based. Well, that's the interesting thing. As, as you say, there's a very serious thing that happens. Richard Gadd, who, as you say, did the show in Edinburgh and has been very open to people in the industry about who that person was. So people in the industry know who that person is. Well, that's, the, di- that's the difficulty, you see, the complexity of him having put the material yeah. out there before in, in another format. Um, and obviously that person hasn't been prosecuted, has never gone to trial, but everyone knows who he is talking about. Now, it comes out now and a completely different person is identified, someone who has produced um, Richard Gadd before, but is definitively not the person in any way. But the, the person they've cast in that role looks like this other guy. It looks like the guy who's been falsely accused. And it's such a weird, bizarre thing to do, because this poor guy is now, but he's had death threats and he's had to issue a statement to say it's not me. Right. And it is, it is not him. But definitely not, because people in the industry know who it is, and it is Richard definitely Gadda not him. Richard Gadda said it's not yes, him. Yes, Richard Gadda said it's not him. Um, honestly, I think they had no idea it was going to be such a huge hit. I think they had no idea it was going to become such a huge Yeah, because it arrived sort phenomenon. of without fanfare. Yeah, it, it, it really did. But and there's something very compelling about that first-person yeah. narrative. Um, it's totally kind of, you know, propulsive. You, you yeah. have to keep going. It's sort of unlike anything you've ever seen before in an in a interesting way. But I, I can't think they would have predicted it. And so maybe the eye yeah, was taken off the ball. they should have predicted it. Yeah. And actually, in terrestrial public service television, they would have, they, to. They would have had to have predicted it. Yeah. And somebody's you know neck would be on the chopping block if they hadn't. Because I have huge sympathy with both, uh, not to a much lesser extent with Netflix, who I don't necessarily have huge sympathy with, but with Richard Gadd, because... Are we saying now in this era of social media that people can't tell their stories of what yeah. happened? People have always told their stories of what have happened to them. And to a large extent, what's happening here is that this is TV companies failing in this case to do stuff that they actually wouldn't have never have had to bother with in the era before social media because it wouldn't have been possible to do this. And these frenzies, that phrase we've used before that no snowflake thinks it's part of an avalanche. You know, you're, <laughs> you're writing this, you're sharing this thing, you're saying maybe this thing. You don't realise that, or you don't think... You're not conscious that another 100,000 people have shared that thing as well. In an interview to promote the show, he said of the real life Martha, we've gone to such great lengths to disguise her to the point that I don't think she would recognise herself. Well, I'm afraid that isn't the case, and it's certainly not even the case with really quite half-hearted sleeping on social media that people recognised her. You don't have to be Colleen Rooney to work out who she is. (laughs) Now, I believe that, you know, it is the job of... TV companies that are hugely rich and powerful to understand what era they live in. You're telling me Netflix doesn't understand big tech? Well, I think it does. It is big tech, okay, to some extent. It is. And I really think it's extraordinary that it's got to this stage. Lots of stuff wasn't changed. So you're left with Richard Gadd who I do think, of course, should be able to tell his story. Um, this yeah, is not, 100%. And he's done so brilliantly in it, blah, blah, blah. But these things should have been better disguised. And I don't think this would have happened... I don't think for a minute this would have happened at the BBC. And I don't think it would have happened at ITV. I think that far more care would be taken with compliance. And you don't know how this story is going to end now, and I should say that. You've just got to be so careful. You know, when I was thinking of talking about this, I was thinking about something in my own life that I could perhaps use to shed light on this mm. this morning when we were chatting. And I thought... You know what, I'm not going to do it because even I, and perhaps because I'm in the news media, but I can see round the corners and I could see how people could uncover what I was about to say and I could see how people could find people who about whom I may talk. Yeah. And I, I, you, I, you probably think you're keeping this so vague, I don't actually know what you're talking about. And I suppose that's the point. I am trying to keep it very vague because I can see around the corners. It was their job to see around the corners and they failed to do so. And when you've got a mega hit like that, by the way, this has been like number one in loads of other oh, territories, not huge. just the UK. It's yeah. massive. And they didn't particularly promote it. I wasn't like aware of it as one of their big yeah. shows that was coming. They should have understood this and they must understand this going forward in an era of social media, which we've been in quite some time now. Yeah, I mean, 
so Richard Gadd, who has who has been around a long time and has you know, won Edinburgh Awards and done you know incredibly interesting, very unusual shows at Edinburgh for years and years, and yeah, this should be his crowning triumph. He's taken something that happened to him, something that was clearly very traumatic. He's written, I would say, a, a fairly great piece of art about it, and it's his huge break, and suddenly. He's got the thing that yeah. he always wanted. And, you know, judging by the quality of what he's written, the thing that he always deserved as well. And it has led immediately to absolute panic for everybody involved. So it must be a very, very unusual and difficult place for I mean, it's almost, it's, it's so odd because it's so sort of meta. It's echoed in some yeah. ways in the show, within the body of the show itself. And it, you know, as yes, I he say... Yes, he sort of goes viral in the show itself. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, you, you, you would think that it was dealable with i wonder if because it did start as an uh, edinburgh show and so all these things have been aired already oh, no, that's such, and I, which perhaps, is a, such a smaller environment and yes. you're not going to have this great social media but kind per- of... perhaps the filmmakers and netflix were thinking well look this has been pre-legaled uh you know what an edinburgh run and a very minor netflix show might have similar um audiences and similar issues but uh, an edinburgh run and the biggest show in the world for a week have very 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 different audiences and as you say that's that's the point of all the money that is spent on compliance and aftercare and all of those things is just in case. And this is the absolute classic example of just in case. Maybe we can talk a little bit about, based on a true story, which mm. particularly via Netflix, has become... Some producers just almost think it's an, like an IP genre in itself. Yeah. It gives a show such a lot of... And obviously sometimes shows like Fargo say this is a true story and it's not. Or, yeah, because it's a joke, a, yeah. that's a different reason. It's a sort of, you know, it's a, it's a trope. It's a sort of fictional meta of something. But in the case of true stories, which Netflix are, have really tried to corner the market in, they're very sued even in the US, which is quite weird where they sort of regard libel like cheap gas as their birthright you know <laughs> they yeah. just be, first amendment i can say whatever i like all the time things like that inventing anna now that which is about this you know this con woman one of those kind of scam artists yeah it's often the sort of supporting characters in shows like that because real life is messy um and it doesn't quite fit yeah sometimes those supporting characters become quite caricatured in order to wait you know without getting too technical on the writing to make the to make the story work when you're coming to tell it for, yeah. as a fictional thing they, they have to be a certain sort of engine yeah they have yeah. exactly and because they're a supporting character a side character they're kind of there as not entirely as a plot device but yeah. they're there to help that now a lot of those supporting characters are suing Netflix. And in the case of the one that we're inventing, Anna, that case is going ahead in the US, yeah. which is, again, as I say, it's quite hard to prove defamation in the US because they're kind of allowed to say anything, very much unlike the UK. And Netflix is becoming a very sort of sued entity by people who feel they've been misrepresented in these so-called based on a true story shows. I like, I like the idea of being a sued entity. Yeah, there's a lot of these cases that are either going forward or in the pipeline and w- w- whether we'll get to hear them or not. Um, but... I really think that if you say this is a true story, and there are elements of this story, by the way, particularly in, involved in the resolution, which are not what happened in the true story. So even talking to executives and commissioners and all sorts of different people this week, some of them said to me, yeah, I think even based on a true story would have helped in this. Yeah. But it's saying right off the bat, this is a true story. And the online chatter about it is always, is absolutely, oh my God, this actually happened. Yeah. Well, this is real. That's but a real it's person. Such a, yeah. and th- sorry. And th- I guess the reason I brought this up is that people love a story that was real and yeah. they can't believe it. They, they, you know, the, a huge amount of it is like, oh my God, it blows my mind that this whole thing is true. Yeah. But now people are talking about things that happen. If you look at the online chatter about it, they're saying, oh, well, all this sort of stuff happened. And you're thinking, yeah, but that was the bit in the This Is A True Story that didn't actually turn out in that exact way. Yeah. And so... There's like a, a breakdown he has at a gig, which so you, you would maybe look for that footage, and that footage doesn't exist because, that, as you say, that's a that's a plot line. Well, I would say that the, the sort of legal resolution with the stalker did not occur in the way yeah. that it is presented in the, in the show. and that, But people think that the show is complete fact. Yeah, the denouement of the piece, which is in a court case... Uh, which we won't go into details of, but didn't happen. I mean, didn't happen, and, pe- and people have assumed, of course they've assumed, it says it's a true story, that it did happen, that it's part of the story, and 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 it's not. It's, it's, it's an imagination. Yes, it is an imagination, and without getting too deeply into it, I I think that it is obviously is pre- presented as fact because you, you're constantly thinking it's a true story. It's quite tricky, that now, and I think they really are going to have to think much, much harder going forward because... Social media is a fact of life and 
these companies are definitely not going to look after anybody, the TikTok or Twitter or Instagram or any of the places where people are trying to do their sleuthing on these shows. Yeah, I think that um, certainly if you were making a show now for any of the streamers or for anybody um, that is about a real person, then this week your compliance just got tightened by about 8,000%. Because I, I think this will be the, the sort of patient zero of... Uh, of, of Netflix compliance. Of Maybe Netflix they've got com- a big department. I don't wish to speculate, but <laughs> they're uh, not but doing a very good job. Um, Richard Gadd says um, in the most 2024 sentence ever, this story is emotionally 100% true. By the way, I absolutely get what he means because he has taken his trauma, which is genuine, and turned it into a piece of art, yeah, and which we is must, a genuine piece of art. People must be allowed to do this yeah. because people have done this forever and they must be allowed to do this. I would say, though, as a counterpoint, is it a counterpoint that it's yeah. it's it's really worth a watch? Oh, yeah. I mean, a little pinch of salt and please don't do online sleuthing and, you know, all, all, all the usual caveats. But it's, you know, it's, it's a great piece of work. I do think Jessica Gunning, who, who plays the stalker, is going to win every award going. So oh, she's fantastic. She's, yeah, she's, she's uh, brilliant. Performance. It's very interesting. And it's, it's an interesting case of what happens when you suddenly have an enormous hit on your hands. If there's even the slightest crack in the yeah. foundations of that hit, then it, it will open into a chasm. And that, that I think, is what's happened here. I mean, it's, it's an, I'm sure they're happy. It's an enormous hit. But um, I think Clark and Will Films make it and Richard Gadd and Netflix must be um, fielding an awful lot of calls this weekend, and, and rightly so. Shall we talk about Liz Truss? Don't turn off. We're talking about her book sales. I, I, don't I, worry. We're talking about Liz Truss as a publishing story. Yes, I promise it's fun. I don't think we'd describe her as a publishing phenomenon, would we, Richard? Well, I think, yeah. Phenomenon. Well, everything's a phenomenon. It's a thing. Yes, exactly. So her book, 10 uh, Years to Save the West, mm-hmm. 10 Years to Monetize Her Brief Moment in Number 10, a lot of hoopla about it, serialised in all sorts of places. Um, I've even seen articles this week. I'll go on to one in The Spectator, which is, the single worst thing I've ever seen written about the book industry of all time. Well done, guys. We will we will get into it. Yeah. But yeah, I've seen Hoopla saying it was it was it was a bestseller. Um, it sold two thousand two hundred copies, which I'm going to go on record. Is as that saying, in the UK because it's had a UK and a US is, release? We it, should say in the US there are charts that go down a long way. It is not in those charts. <laughs> the UK was the one. Um, it went in at number seventy. And by the way, your first week that's your. Big week. week. Yes. Week one, after week one on two. Because that's when all your promotion is happening, everything. And if yeah. you can manage to get yourself yeah. in the top 10 in week oh, one, then, y- you know, then there should be a long tail, etc. Yes. But you can yeah. build. Also, week one in- includes every single pre-sale. So every single person who pre-ordered that uh, over the last six months, that all counts in week one. And that all added up to about two. We should say it was serialised in the Daily Mail. She was number 70. Number 59, selling 3,300, was the Sticker Dolly Dressing Magical Kingdom. My daughter's got that. Oh, well, there yeah, you go. I've got, yeah, I haven't got the Liz Truss book, yeah. but yeah. And that, that wasn't even in week one. That's just that's just nicely bobbing along, the old uh, Sticker Dolly Dressing Magical Kingdom. So, yeah, it's it's a very low seller. I sold fewer than Matt Hancock's book sold in its first week. That, by the way, Richard, is at certain weeks of the year, not the weeks you release your books, obviously, but at certain weeks of the year, that is enough to maybe scrape you into the top 10. You might scrape in at 10. You might scrape into the top 10 hardback non-fiction. Yeah, well... Which is, uh, you, you, have, you have to keep adding Richard, this is Matt Hancock's words. Pandemic Diaries. I think that would be doing quite well if he'd done that. It went down to 600 the week after, I think. First of all, it was published by Biteback. And Biteback have got a good sort of... In general, they've got quite good economics. They only paid, by the way, £1,500 uh, for the publication rights to this book. Or, by the way, Liz Truss has only got an American agent, which I sort of love. Like, really? yeah, I don't know. There's some, it's someone called Javelin. Javelin was the code name of Donald Rumsfeld, Secret Service code name of Donald Rumsfeld's wife. And Donald wow. Rumsfeld, course, former cause... chief of staff, yeah. runs this book agency. Wow. Yeah, uh, he was, yeah, and... You forget he was married to Fatima Whitbread, don't you? <laughs> you forget. They, he doesn't talk about it very much. Yeah. So Bite Back um, bought them for £1,500. I think the, whoever is publishing him in the US, I think they paid 6000 Yeah. I should say, by the way, that it, I don't, I've not seen this discussed. Sorry if it has been, everybody. But I saw in her um, register of members' interest where the MPs have to say, you know, what, what money's coming in and what they've, you know, she's making, by the way, a lot of money from speeches, a yeah. lot. I saw that she was making like 15 grand, which is... which is No, but sometimes of... 65 grand, sometimes... Really? Yeah, yeah, she's got a okay. lot of big ones that she gets and then sometimes it's a little bit, but it's in London. But, you know, she, you're going to China and you're getting 65 grand. I, I can't really... Um, I mean, that feels like someone deficit funding something, doesn't it? Yeah, it I feels d- like a lot of things. I don't think if you're the O2, you're not thinking, 
I tell you, let's pay Liz 65 grand. We, you, you know we'll make it back on the bar. I agree on this, but um, she says in that that she's taken 90 hours to write this book. I haven't, so I haven't seen that. So that's about two weeks' work. Now, Oscar Wilde actually claimed to have written the picture of, of Dorian Gray in less than two weeks. And I'm going to go out on a limb here. It is better than 10, <laughs> ten years to save the worst. <laughs> Having said that, okay, so Bite Back have got this good pu- publishing model. hours? Yeah. I mean, it keeps saying it's 100,000 words, which, by the way, it's not, because I looked at the page count. Yeah. Uh, but that would be, she's writing 1,000 <laughs> words She claims an it's hour. no more... Yeah. We're aware she can do things quickly. Look at how quickly she crashed the economy. Yeah, but I she, don't, did, she can do it in a heartbeat like that. She I, can do it in one speech. I don't think she's written 100,000 words in 90 hours. God well, bless. Well, I have this thing where they give you um, a very low advance. Yeah. Um, and if you do well, I think your advice is always if you can afford it. Take a, take, a, take a low advance. Take a low, or don't take it. Some yeah. people don't even take one if they are able to. Yeah. Clive James once told me, no, I never take advances anymore because you, you earn out miles quicker and it's, yeah, you, can you explain that bit to me? Yeah, I'm not... so, so it says she's got a £1,500 advance. I think it would be six grand actually because I think she'll get paid in four chunks. So I think her advance is £6,000. Okay. And people were laughing and saying, oh, God, Boris got half a million and this, that, or the other. The whole point with an advance is it, it, it sort of doesn't matter what your advance no. Is certainly if you can write a book in two weeks, it doesn't matter what your advance is because you, you haven't had to fund yourself for those two weeks. I don't know what Oscar Wilde's advance for the picture yeah. of Drawing Gray was. <laughs> uh, and what it means is if you do get an advance, so Boris gets half a million for a book he hasn't written yet, you have to earn that back for the publisher before you see another yeah. penny. Uh, and so Liz Trusser would only have to earn back £6,000 from this book and would then start getting royalties. In fact, she's, I think the independent quoted someone as saying um, she's relying on royalty payments to make serious money from the book. Um, Here's a newsflash. If you sell 2,200 books in week one, you are, you are not going to be making serious money from royalties. It's Again, in this, in this Spectator article I'll get onto, it said they, that Biteback have already made their money back. I mean, they definitely haven't made it back on book sales. They might have done on um, on serialisation, but uh, yeah, they, they, they definitely yeah. haven't on book sales. There was a lot of sort of thing like, oh, we've had to reprint yeah, because Amazon that. have run out of it. Yeah. Which are completely different things. So Amazon run out of books sometimes. Amazon work out how many people want to buy a book, buy it because Amazon don't want to have extra stock in their no. warehouses. This is like a really. Technical... You saying they didn't buy five hundred thousand copies of Liv Strauss's book? They did not. Weirdly. Wow, well, Bezos, what's wrong with you? Wake <laughs> exactly. up. Exactly. Uh, and so for, oh, I'm going to talk about this Spectator article because every Please. bit of, of it was so bad. Um, it said, "Oh yeah, Amazon sold out, so they've immediately gone for a reprint." You think, right? No. They haven't gone for a reprint, right? The, the reprint, it's quite expensive to print a book, so you print however many you think are going to be sold. I don't know how many they would have done with Liz Truss's book, 20,000, maybe something like that. Amazon Punchy. say, we're going to sell, you know, a 1,000. Uh, and when they get towards the end of that 1,000, they will immediately say they're out of stock and you have to then deliver more to their warehouse. And yeah. when they're delivered to the warehouse, it comes back into stock. So it's not that it's sold out. It's not that you're having to reprint because of, you know, incredible Second demand. Second run on Liz Truss's book in 14 minutes. Yeah, exactly. It's because Amazon didn't think it was going to do... Amazon sort of roughly work out how many it's going to sell, never overstock, and then at some point you have to restock them. So it hasn't reprinted, and Amazon was immediately back in stock. So The Spectator have written this article about Liz Truss's book sales which is the most incorrect article I've ever read in my life. It's, it's beautiful in its incorrectness. It starts by saying um, her, her book sales may ruffle feathers. There's, that's, that's the tone of the thing throughout and, yeah. and, and gets more and more bonkers as it goes on. So I'll just pick out some reasons why it's bonkers. It's talking about how it's number one in political biography on Amazon. Now, Amazon has this brilliant thing, and it work, works really, really well, where they have a million different subcharts, so everyone can be number one somewhere. I'm always number one in rural life humour. Okay, that's where, my, that's where my book is always. I saw Liz Truss was number one in philo- political philosophers at one well, point, whatever that political is. Political yeah. philosophers. And this article in The Spectator said, um, it's talking about uh, Rory Stewart, our friend Rory Stewart, and said, Rory Stewart may be displeased to learn that he's like number 90 in political biography. Saying, yeah, that's because his book has been out for a year. Rory He'll Stewart's, be crying into his bank yeah. balance because that sold a load. Rory Stewart's book in week one sold 25,000 copies. Yeah. That's 11 times more and has gone on to sell, it's, I think it's up to about 200,000 hardbacks, which is a lot of books and certainly more than Liz Truss's ever, ever, ever going to sell. The article in The Spectator was also talking about the Prince Harry books. It's even outsold Prince Harry. Oh, my God. It's the single, that is the biggest selling hardback (laughs) non-fiction launch of all time. You know, that's like saying last week more people watched House of Games than watched the moon landings. Because last (laughs) week they did, you know. But the moon landings is still 
the biggest TV show <laughs> of all time. It was absolutely extraordinary. It was it was doing everything to say this this is a huge hit. And listen, it sold two thousand two hundred copies. Plenty of books would be happy with that, but not books where you've been in the papers all week and you know no, you want to. If we could talk about serialization for a bit, because that is yes. quite interesting. So serialization goes direct to you, and it doesn't necessarily count against the event. All everyone's got a different deal, but in yeah. general, you would expect that to go to the author. Now, so she would have got a, a decent whack. I'm trying to think how much. Now, Matt Hancock got forty eight thousand pounds for his pandemic diary serialization which is also in the mail the mail often gets these because they've got a lot more money than a lot of fleet street and so they might buy these things but that also included an interview right. and serialization and oh let's God. not forget he had had an affair with yeah. gina lola brigida as i insist on calling yes. her real name gina Colla d'angelo but he had had an affair and i think that was probably quite sort of hooky Fight Back know how to make their books really newsy and how to get the news lines out. They're very good at that and how you can get lots of coverage. And they did get lots of coverage, but in the end, no one wanted to buy this book. If I'm trying to call what Liz Truss got for a serialisation, I was talking to people and they were saying she probably got less than Matt Hancock, mm. um, who got 48, because he'd had this affair. And I think that was the big thing that people would want to talk about. Yeah. If only if only Liz Truss had ever had an affair. I know, if only she, if only she had had an affair, then it, it would have been something more to read about. Will we find out in the in the Register of Members' uh, interest Ultimately, we will find out, yeah. yes. But we won't find out for f until she registers it. And she could do it either in a few months or later. Or yeah. Maybe wait till the lack of fuss has died down. <laughs> it's a fascinating thing, because Hancock suffered from the same thing, I think, which is one of the things about writing a book as a politician. Um... Some some books, by the way, politicians' books do amazingly. Yeah. Uh, Obama's book is an absolute huge yeah. seller. Um, Blair's was Michelle Obama's was a was a was was a huge book as well. But one of the reasons you would write this book, you know, especially as it only took a two weeks supposedly, is firstly the sort of you know get your retaliation in first, and secondly just to boost your profile a bit so you get to go on all the TV programs, you get to go on Lorraine if you want to, if you uh, if you write a book. Um, the trouble that she has, and Hancock's got the same thing, is there's no charisma there. There is no, no. There, there are certain people that if you put them on TV, Rory Stewart was a very good example. You put them on TV, people, there's something about him that people like listening to. Uh, and she doesn't have that. And that's no reflection on her. It's just she doesn't connect with people in that way. And so she's had. <laughs> I mean, it is a reflection on her. Well, and it, it was a bit yeah, of a, yeah. a stumbling block to but doing it, her job. But, but it's yes. okay to not be, it's okay to not be charismatic. Yeah. Bit rubbish if you're the prime minister, but you know, <laughs> feels um, to me like it is one of the things, but. So there's, there's certain people, you know, who, when they go on TV to talk about their book, where you go, oh, that's, that's costing you copies. You're not going to sell any more copies from, from, from that. I'm afraid that's, uh, you know, and you can see on Amazon. One interesting thing, if you ever watch something like, um, this morning or Graham Norton and someone talks about a book and you think they pitch it particularly well look at the Amazon chart four hours later and you'll see and it's be gone right up yeah. yeah and there are radio shows like this things like yeah. Start the Week which will suddenly sort of catapult. there's lots of yeah, shows exactly. that you wouldn't necessarily think but Zoe there's Ball, huge market the one show. movers if you, yeah. the, if you go on the one show you're, the first time any of my books went to number one before Thursday Murder Club came out, so just in pre-release, and it went it, it went to number. The first time it ever went to number one is just I went I launched it on the one show, and it just immediately went up there. We've got to do a deep dive on the one show at some point because oh that would God. be such fun. Please can way, we do that. Yes. I have yeah, I presented the one show and love the one show. Yeah. it's one of my favourite jobs. In the You've world. got some very funny stories about the one show, <laughs> which I'm going to make you tell. <laughs> Excellent. At least fifty percent of them. Um. So yeah, she's been on this publicity thing, which is you know not going to sell any books and not really going to boost her reputation either because, you know, she but doesn't... it's all from the US. You know, she hasn't got a UK yeah. agent. She's got someone in, like, Washington. Yeah. <laughs> Some DC-based agent. They did get her. I don't know if they booked her at CPAC, which was the, is the sort of a conservative conference in America where you saw her, where, where she ran into trouble because she was on an event with Steve Bannon who said Tommy Robinson was a hero or something yeah. in that vein. Um, and she didn't really challenge him. And you're saying um, he's not? Breaking, he's not a hero. He's such a lefty. Um, but she, she went on Fox News news with that book um she held it upside down i think she had to be told to get it the right way up <laughs> um but perhaps she saw her future as a in a, that sort of american thing and maybe someone told her that they can launch her as a personality that yeah. i think once they're looking javelin agency at this particular sales line yeah they're going to think that it's going to be a harder ask to turn her into like Oasis, I think uh, I think she may be doomed in America. I don't I don't think it's going to work for her. I, I was looking at um, you know, on Amazon customers also bought. Yeah. And on American Amazon, it's quite it's, it, was, it was number seven thousand on American Amazon last time I looked. But customers also bought Deception, the Great COVID cover up by Rand Paul, The Great Awakening launching the next Great Resistance by Alex Jones. 
so oh, Alex dear. Jones' book, uh, and the Citizen's Guide to Fifth Generation Warfare. Those were the people also bought. Wow! But that's what you know. If that's the pool she wants to to smash her feet in, you know, that's it's that's where she's looking for money, right? There it's, is a small part of me I have to say. And, and obviously she has done something terrible and whatever, but I don't know. Yes, she should never have been made prime minister and all those things. But there is something slightly exhilarating about someone just carrying on and just refusing yeah. to be sort of cancelled. And uh, I don't know, it, it's a sort of a good example for her daughters. I don't know. Yeah, I, no, I, I know that people, this is maybe is like a real minority opinion, but someone just thinking, I'm actually not going to go and live, live in shame. Yeah. And even though, as I say, what she did was very shameful, but there is something quite sort of, inspo about someone just thinking I'm actually not going to have a terrible sad life and cry on the floor I, I was talking to someone who, who worked for her and liked her very much indeed genuinely said it was a, it was a really nice environment I really liked her um but yeah she I've she's, had some alternatives to that yes yeah, so listen I'm sure yeah. but it, it, it's uh uh it's fascinating to see the dollar that she is chasing now and to see whether she's going to get that dollar, and to see that the shapes that she has to sort of twist herself into to get it. Ted Cruz was, uh, is, you know, is, is quoted on the back of her book in this one. She's, she's talking about how it'd be great if we got rid of Joe Can Biden. Can you imagine and, how little of the book Ted Cruz has? Has oh, he read the title? I very much doubt he's read the title. He's probably read about as much as Liz Truss has. <laughs> um, no, I'm sure she wrote this. Yeah. Um, just very, very, very quickly. It's an unusual thing. I, I, I went to an event that Armando Iannucci was talking about, and he, he was saying that there's a generation now who see becoming prime minister as just a step on the ladder to something else, to step on the ladder to money or whatever, and she's yeah. definitely one of them. It's not kind of you spend out your whole career trying to be prime minister and anything. I did it. I now retire gracefully and go and watch cricket like John Major. Yeah. You're like, oh, perhaps if I'm prime minister, then I can go over to America and talk on the lecture circuit. Uh, and listen, it may... She it, could easily contort herself, having the, the, the sheer number of sort of ideological mis- metamorphoses she's kind of been through. She could easily end up being an expert in whatever fifth generation warfare is. I'm yes, not exactly. quite sure. Oh my God. But she could easily end up doing one of those things. But whatever we say about it and whatever spin you might see, publishing-wise, it is it, it has not moved the dial no. at all. Publishing-wise, you, you, you'd be happier publishing Sticker Dolly Dressing Magical Kingdom. Don't knock it. I'm not knocking it. I've got so many of the Sticker Dolly Dressing series. I can't believe I'm doing a plug for Osborne's Sticker Dolly Dressing series, but it's terrific. But also on the back, because the quotes on the back are from you and from Ted Cruz, yeah. right, of the uh, of that Magical <laughs> Kingdom thing. Ted Cruz. See, that, that is a book I do believe he's read. Yeah. Now, shall we talk about, and it's going to have some celebrity in it before you think it's just AI, AI celebrity chatbots, Richard. Yeah, which, as I say, is a, is a subject you introduced me to. I'd say I'd say it's haunting. It's funny, but it's haunting. Yes, it like is. Like ghosts. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now Meta, which is obviously the company that owns various things, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, Messenger, um, they did an announcement very recently, um, a presentation where they are and where they're going with AI inside all of those apps. And they are sort of rolling out a chat GPT style bot across these apps. And it's their large language model is called Llama. I think they're on Llama 3, which, by the way, is nothing like as powerful as chat GPT 4. However, it does have some advantages, which is that it is free um, and it is very, very quick at doing things like pictures. So if you've ever sort of sat there waiting for a picture to come on chat GPT or whatever, this, this is really fast. And what they want to do is bring AI into your conversations with your friends' connections in their social networks, basically. The bit we're going to talk about today is celebrity-related because um, I'm, I must say that I'll give a little bit shout-out to a guy called Casey Newton who writes a, an email called Platformer, which is really, really good on tech, AI, big tech, AI, whatever. Um, and he's been talking a lot recently about the idea of the synthetic social network because obviously we at the moment we interact with avatars of real people we yeah. know or whoever, whatever. So the first iteration of this product... The, ch- the celebrity chatbot was weird and misconceived and odd. That doesn't they, sound like meta. Yeah, exactly. They paid some rumours of like maybe $5 million to um, various celebrities. I think there were 28 of them. People like Kendall Jenner, um, Snoop Dogg, and Naomi Saka. I can't remember who the, all the others Mr. were. Mr Beast was one. Mr Beast was one, yeah. About before. But the product was weird and it was basically off. Like it was Snoop Dogg, but he wasn't called Snoop Dogg. And... He was some sort of Dungeons and Dragons games master. Kendall Jenner was just like some random LA friend. And so, as as as, he, as a as a actual human being, you could 
you could see them talking. Could, it seemed could, like you were interacting with them, yeah. um, but you weren't, and it was all AI. No one really cared, by the way. Like, okay. no one cared. Like, nobody, they didn't have any followers. These things. I think even the Snoop Dogg one, he's got, like, unbelievable millions on all his other platforms, and he got, like, 80,000 of this. But they were just paid to do it. Anyway, now Meta is going to do something completely different, which is they're going to train chatbots in the way that the participating celebrities speak, and then a chatbot version of that celebrity will interact with the fans already i mean as we've seen you they can do they can create a you from a tiny amount now i mean yeah. you can give them microsoft unveiled this sort of ai assistant thing the other week um which is called vasa v-a-s-a and you can give them a tiny bit of audio and one picture and then you can see this person speaking so we got ai to do um the intro to this show Shall we take a listen to ourselves and see if we are better in AI than in reality? Let's do it. Hello and welcome to The Rest is Entertainment. I'm Richard Osman. And I'm Marina Hyde. What are we talking about in today's show, Marina? Well, today, Richard, we are going to be talking about a brand new software which can clone our voices. Sounds fascinating. It is fascinating, if not terrifying, when it do our jobs even better than us. That was terrifying. I went slightly Belfast for one second. A little bit, a little bit On Irish. the word going. Yeah. Um, but that I think that's terrifying. Or I, I see. I think it's. I think. I mean. I mean. Useful. Yeah. I would we say. Could just sit down and have a cup of tea. Well, this is why I tell you that podcasts are very vulnerable to AI. Yeah. I tell you what. I tell you what. AI doesn't like dead air. No. So absolutely, we're running on from each other's sentences there. Yeah. I mean, I could learn a lot from it. <laughs> The reason I think this is very terrifying, there's actually a really interesting guy, and he died this year, and he was a, he's a sort of cognitive philosopher. He's a, a guy called Daniel Dennett, and he wrote this fascinating essay that came out maybe last year, um, and it was called Counterfeit People. And his theory is, he's a really eminent and amazing philosopher, he wasn't it, and that these are digital artefacts that are being created, which he thinks can destroy our economies, they can destroy all our freedoms, they can permanently... That's Liz Truss's job. Yeah, I, exactly. Ten years to save the West, This she would have, should have written about this. Um, but he thinks that the creation of fake people is an immoral act, and it, it is a form of social vandalism that should be published punished by law. Um, and he gives the example of money, mm. counterfeit money. There's a reason why every single society on this planet has really draconian laws against counterfeit money, including passing it on. As in, you know, and I suppose in counterfeit, you might say retweeting them or reposting them okay. or whatever it may be. And he feels that. We, it's because money is a sort of similar idea. It, the whole, all the bonds in our society depend on that kind of trust. And if it, if you don't have that, then things fall apart really, really quickly. Um, and inst he said, look, we could all these fake people that you're now seeing on online. Yeah. We could watermark. It's very easy for them to sort of effectively walk watermark it. They can work out with code very quickly what's real and what isn't. Instead, what we do is say, "Oh my God, that's so weird." You know, "Oh my God, it is like Kendall Jenner, but it's not quite like her." And we're sort of fascinated by it. We are really walking ourselves to our own slaughter because his point is, OK, if you look at someone like Narendra Modi, obviously to win votes, he's got AI versions of himself speaking in all the different regional languages, which is very helpful to him. But mm. it's a, this is a form of political manipulation that is happening right now. Yeah. And his Daniel Dennett's idea is, you know, if this happens and these really clever counterfeit people come and you can't hardly tell, and once we start seeing these meta celebrity chatbots, these are, you know, celebrities are really always the sort of soft launch of all this yeah. stuff. And as we can see in India, it's already happening. Lots of other places in politics, political manipulation is already happening via AI and it's going to in the elections coming. But we'll be manipulated, we'll become paranoid, we'll become ultra skeptical like we won't even believe true things and yeah. then you then you become apathetic or kind of terminally unmoved and that is a real that that is breaking down as a society and then anyone can ride roughshod over you so it may start with chatting about makeup in your dms with kendall jenner but it really quickly ends up with very very bad political actors taking control of countries economies freedoms all sorts of things like that there's a, a, a TikToker called Karen uh, Majori who did exactly this. She was one of the first people to do it. She's got an AI version of herself that interacts with her fans. Uh, and she was saying, no, the reason I'm doing it is because I want to cure loneliness. This was her... This was her thing. I oh, think Karen. also she might have wanted to monetize it as well. I don't know. And but she maybe she to, made a couple of quid. She wanted to cure loneliness, and she thinks that someone talking in an AI version of herself is uh, will do that. That that's a healthy way to um, in, increase your social circle. Um, 
and she said she's done that by working with the world's leading psychologists. Brackets, citation needed. Yeah. Um, and so yeah. you can see why all celebrities are going to do this. Yes. Uh, because it's honestly... It could, Many of them don't even run their social media anyway. So yeah. you're already in a version of a synthesised interaction, whether or not you even realise it. This yeah. is the next step in that. Because at the moment they're having to pay an assistant to be them. Yeah. And sooner or later they won't have to pay anyone to be them. But there's companies, Forever Voices, I think, are the ones who do um, Karen Majori's um, stuff. And they will own part of your likeness and your soundness as well uh, for a very long time to pay you for it. But, you know... They're going to own who you are, and as you say, so once... you don't get final final approval. I assume they must do in the in, in the contracts and what have you. But you're certainly but you signing listen, a deal. But the thing is, you can't listen. To, yeah. If you, she could be interacting with a hundred thousand people at any given moment. Well, in which case, she's not going to approve anything. It will shock you to learn that within a month, um, they were saying hey, we we do need to make some tweaks because um, the uh, chats were getting too erotic. I think oh. they were surprised by the fact that the thing that people were using it for was to try. It was to try. Who and can have, predict these things, Richard? Who yeah. can predict that humans Who would do this thing? Can predict that. And listen. Did she cure loneliness? Um, hold on. Let me check. Let me check on the phone. It's still going. It is it's still going now. Pending. But, but she's apparently she's helping. Yeah. I'm looking at the mm. charts here. So here, listen. Two points of view, and people at home can take one or the other. So Daniel Dennett yeah. essentially says this sort of these parasocial relationships where you're talking to someone who isn't real and we can't trust what we're seeing and we can't trust the people we're talking to will lead to the end of civilization well, but yeah mark zuckerberg <laughs> says it's all about entertainment and it will feel fun and familiar so listen six of one half a dozen of the Just other one of the worst people alive because the other thing about these technologies is that they unlike nuclear weapons or other sort of known harmful technologies or potentially harmful technologies these have an organic quality in that they can reproduce so mm. these kind of AIs can reproduce and potentially become, as we've discussed on various different occasions, much more powerful than they were originally intended and more powerful, by far more powerful than their creators. But I will say this to people, you know, on their dog walk or, you know, driving the kids to school or anything like that. Um, it's all going to be OK, isn't it? <laughs> Am I, Marina? Well, I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. That's I mean, as I've stuff. said before, I think podcasts are very vulnerable to this technology because it'd be, it'd be very, very easy to create AI podcasts. You think? Yes, very, very easy. And I think we'll be seeing that we, maybe that we already are. And someone oh my will God, come out and say that hit was, by the way, entirely AI. I really think that is almost imminent. Music, for sure. I yes. can't believe there hasn't been an AI number one single yet. That feels like the easiest thing in the world. Some art collective putting together a, a song just by AI. If they're making money, they will think, I don't want to say anything. And there are always those yeah. things where you're like, oh my God, that was a model and she wasn't really singing. You know, we had those Millie stories. Vanilli. Yeah. That was the yeah. first real, first yes. AI there, wasn't it? Yeah. Was, what about Black Box, Ride on Time? Was she not, maybe not the actual singer? She was not the singer. Yeah. That was, uh, she, yeah, Loretta Holloway. Yeah. Uh, Loretta uh, Holloway, I think, was the original Loretta singer. Loretta was. Yeah. Was she? Okay. And yeah, it was an Italian model was the... Uh, yeah. Was, she yeah. looked amazing. So but... we've had it for years, is what you're saying. Yeah. So it's fine. But uh, yes, I think this is of a different order. But yeah, we're definitely going to add Kendall Jenner to our, our, Z- to our, our group chat. Entertainment group chat. So do you know on our group chat, yes. that Gary Lineker is on it? Yes. Do you think it's really Gary Lineker? No. No, because a lot of the stuff he he's, says. He, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that is just a bot. He yeah. is not, yeah. Because we'll say something like, what time are we recording? And he'll say, um, the great goal by Jeff Schlupp there against Fulham. He's like, <laughs> I don't think that's... Doesn't seem right. They're Gary. working on it. They're perfecting the software. Yeah, yeah. But we're real. So that's the <laughs> we are. We are at, some point, at this we'll stage have to prove real. Yes, and we'll never interact with anyone for synthetic versions of ourselves. But it is coming to social media, um, yeah. and synthetic social media is going to is going to be one of the big trends and the big stories of the next couple of years. Uh, recommendations. Listen, despite what we said, I would I would recommend um, watching Baby Reindeer. It's 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 a challenging watch, but I I, th- I think it's a very very interesting piece of. I think TV. it's completely compelling, and um, I, yes, I would recommend that if you haven't already seen it, along with yeah. many millions of others. And uh, if you can pick up this trust's book anywhere in, in Oxford, pick it then, up uh, and then put it back yeah. down. <laughs> I'm going to count the words. Yeah. Um, Listen, we're back on Thursday, aren't we, for a question and answer back edition? Back on Thursday. Please keep your questions coming to the email addresses, the rest is entertainment at gmail.com. And I promise it's us and not an AI version of no, us. No, we're so faulty that you will be able to tell that it is <laughs> the real us. thing. Yeah, exactly. See you then. The moment we're slick, you'll know it's AI. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>